What makes it tick? Is it the food? The architecture? Or simply the people? From Topayo to Gela, Jurong to Tiongbaru, each neighborhood has its own unique identity. History. And each character will tell you a different story. I think Geelang is unique because it plays the role of a new Chinatown. It's not where I go to feel Singapore. It's, it's where I go to find out about the people who have, who have built my home. They control different uh, lorongs, lorong four and lorong six. were all controlled by different gangs. One neighborhood, many different ways to see it. This is a journey into our heartlands as we travel through our hometowns and show how life has evolved right at your doorstep. This is Project Neighborhood. It's a pretty charming place. A thriving heartland. Many say it's a place where we can find some of the best things the nation has to offer. In one of the oldest neighborhoods on the island, the story of Tiongbaru is one of a big part of our heritage. The whole area of Tiongbaru will continue to serve as a, a heritage, uh, some sort of a heritage uh, housing enclave, but at the same time, it's constantly evolving because there are new people moving in. She is not only a food paradise. Jongbaru revolutionized the way we eat. Perhaps, just like the rest of us today, Jung Baru loved to have fun. She had some of the best places to go at the time. And some are still entertaining others today. And a one, two, three, four. She was also famous in some rather unique ways. But behind all this, Jung Baru hides a dark and troubled past. This was the site of the biggest fire in Singapore's history. You know, looking at the black smoke sky, so confusion, sound, and we, everyone was running. She rose from the ashes to help form the blueprint of modern housing on the island. Her form and function is celebrated by the people in every way imaginable. It's a mixture of memory, architecture, and I create this piece of work. Little champagne in your coffee in the morning. This old neighborhood has attracted the new generations in more ways than we can ever imagine. I have seen the, sun inside you. the story of Jung Baru is one that has been an inspiration to many. Baby, close your eyes, I'll be right beside you. This is a story about our heritage. What if you 
located in the central part of the island. This small neighborhood is less than five kilometers away from the city center. But it is worlds apart from the hustle and bustle of the urban life. It's a charming little place. More than 50,000 people live in the heartlands, in one of the oldest estates on the island. This 79-year-old neighborhood holds the key to some of the earliest memories of Singapore. Perhaps she even provides a glimpse to a part of our identity. I would describe Tiong Bahru as a, a dynamic neighborhood that's constantly evolving with the past and the present uh, elements being juxtaposed together in the same space. In, in that respect, I think the area, the whole area of Tiong Bahru will continue to serve as a, a heritage, uh, some sort of a heritage uh, housing enclave. But at the same time, it's constantly evolving because there are new people moving in, so it's a, a, it's a dynamic sort of setting. And for Singaporeans, there is perhaps nothing more iconic of our past than food. Jiong Baru is a feast for the senses. Hundreds of people flock to Tiong Baru Market every day to indulge in some of the best local fare the island has to offer. It is a one-stop hub for true Singaporean food. This bustling food center holds clues to something that we take for granted today. The name Tiong Baru comes from two languages. Tiong means tombs in Hokkien, and Baru means new in Malay. As the area was being developed, a significant number of hawkers set up food stalls in this old estate, just like the other early neighborhoods of Singapore. These food stalls were a pretty simple affair. They were mobile and sold everything that you could think of from sate to chui kue. Mr. So Chuan Siu used to sell food from one of these mobile stalls during the early 1950s. He sold an old culinary icon that is still enjoyed by Singaporeans today. Prawn noodles. Before the Tiong Bahru market opened in 1955, the hawkers here petitioned for a proper place in the new building. Less than five years later, the Tiong Bahru Food Center was born. As one of the oldest markets and food centers around, it offered something that we take for granted today. The Food Center. A one-stop place where we can find any food you fancy under one roof. It is perhaps a shopping mall of culinary delights. And unlike many other food centers we know today, approximately one-third of the stalls here were the original hawkers who plied their trades along the roads of Tiong Bahru. Even Mr. So is still around today, whipping up his prawn noodles for the people, a recipe that he has kept the same for over 60 years.
，中马路会这样特别的，就是说，初期的时候，新加坡没有这样多小贩中心，而且东东这些是有经验的老人家来做，老人家来做，所以一他们一代传一代，现在这样传下去，变成东马路一个名，很很好听这样。Tiong Bahru has perhaps changed the way we look at food today. She is a food paradise. But just around the corner from here, there is a clue to another part of Tiong Bahru's history that's almost forgotten. The bird singing corner at the Link Hotel reminds us that Tiong Bahru used to be a hotspot for an activity that was iconic in Singapore during the 1970s and 1980s, bird singing competitions. After World War II, many locals adopted the British hobby of keeping birds as pets. As the years progressed, more than 12 bird singing competitions were held in Tiong Bahru and many other Singaporean neighborhoods yearly. The ones in Tiong Bahru, however, were one of the most popular. More than 700 birds would be showcased at any one time. There were the Merba Jambu, Matapute, and Shama. Judges would decide who wins by their birds' loudness, variety, posture, and stamina. Tiong Bahru, I think, 它吸引到很多地方的人都都下来了，然后甚至嘎东啊那些他们喜玩鸟的人，拜六礼拜一定下来这边钓鸟的，所以集中多了啊就很成功了。Now, however, it is a part of Tiong Bahru that is all but forgotten. Others have tried to revive the sport, but it was not to be. Mr. Li Peng Chun now goes to the nearby estate of Bio Crescent to literally show off. More than 20 people gather here every weekend to celebrate a new take on an old sport. Just like how she has progressed through the years, the neighborhood has moved on. Tiong Bahru now sings to a different tune. But her story of heritage is not over. 53 years ago, Tiong Bahru was home to one of the most historic entertainment venues in town. It's a neighborhood that holds clues to our recent past. More than 70 years ago, this small area was home to one of the most popular entertainment venues in the city-state. A modern, thriving shopping hub. Built in 1997, 150 shops and entertainment facilities pack the Great Wall City. It's a prime venue for the people of this neighborhood, and also a clue to an illustrious past. More than 70 years ago, Great Wall City was a very different place. Built in the 1930s, the area was home to one of the most popular entertainment venues in the country, the Great World Amusement Park. This vast land was home to cinemas, theaters, and theme parks, offering entertainment for the masses. Even Elizabeth Taylor came to the grand reopening of Great Wall Amusement Park in 1958. 
Uh, basically, in the post-war era, there was a lot, not a lot of entertainment uh, sort of establishments, not a lot of entertainment uh, areas in Singapore so for people to relax. And, and so, in that uh, respect, Great Wall uh, presents uh, the, the, the population with this avenue for them to, to uh, have fun and to spend some money and, and to relax. And back then, one of the most popular things that Singaporeans did in this big amusement park was perhaps something like what we're used to today. They took the rides. There was a wide variety of rides in the Great Wall Amusement Park, ranging from simple roller coasters to bumper cars and the famous ghost train ride. Mr. James Xia used to frequent the area for the rides during the 1960s. Great World was great in the sense that uh, this is the only place where we have a chance, you know, for the, this uh, village folks, uh, those who stay in uh, Bukit Ho Sui area. And the first time I visited, I was have to be properly dressed, even wearing my shoes, and so was my mother. Yeah, so you find that uh, it's a, not a place where simply you just go around, the great world wearing uh, sandals or clocks or slippers. So it, it was a, a really as if a place that uh, only uh, children at that time will find that it's the only place where they can have the fun land. And that is my experience. Wow, it's something new I've never been before. As a young boy, the first thing that attracted to me is the Joy ride that's inside the uh, amusement park. Yeah. So at the time when I visited, was actually there was a trip fair around the area, and the whole place is so bright, you know, and uh, with lots of kids also. Uh, their family brings them to uh, have the uh, fun land over there. So the joy ride is actually based on the different charge of uh, say. Uh, 30 cents to uh, up to 50 cents for, for each uh, joyride. Most attracted things to me that time was the ghost train. Ghost train and then there was uh, those uh, kind of uh, racing car which I used. There was a carousel. There was um, a things like, uh, you know, this joyride with uh, airplanes and so on uh, that are located inside the um, this Great World Park. But Great World's good times were short-lived. As Singapore progressed, Tiong Bahru was transformed. The area was torn down in the early 1980s, making way for new developments. Today, the area is worlds apart from the days of the past. But some semblances of it still remain today. And one man is still practicing what he has been doing in his old entertainment hub for the past 50 years. Little champagne in your coffee in the morning, hoping you can make it through the day. 71-year-old Mr. Sunny Lau is preparing to teach a class in a job that he knows very well. Ballroom dancing. One, two, three, four, five, six, and a one, two, three, four. Keep going as I see you go. One, yeah, yeah. Look up, look up. Yeah. Wait, wait. Slow and slow. Yeah, slow. Having learned the craft from his father back when he was living in Tiong Bahru, he and his sister, who was his partner, won numerous social dancing competitions since the 1960s and 1970s. Ready, go, slow, quick, quick, slow, rock, 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 slow, quick, quick, slow, rock, 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 quick and quick, quick, quick and slow. And they performed in Great World Cabaret regularly during the 1960s. You see, Great World, uh, it's called Great World Amusement Park. 
Now this ground is about the, you have what you have this uh, merry-go-round. You have all joy rides and all that, you know, and you have a lot of shops, you know. Uh, and then, of course, there's one building which is called the Great World Cabaret. Now, this Great World Cabaret is for people who love how to dance to go there. Actually, dancing uh, from all walks of life, you know. We have people like what clerks, taxi drivers, you have what managers, you know, executives, and so on. Those days, those people who wish to dance without partners, they go to the cabaret. They have to buy coupons to dance with the cabaret girls. Every dance, you have to give the cabaret girl one coupon to dance one dance. People do bring partners to go there and dance, yeah? But those without partners, they will go there and buy tickets to dance with the cabaret girls. Back then, dance shows were held frequently in Great Wool Cabaret. Audiences were treated to performances of ballroom dancing, Gertai and different forms of social dancing in the theatres of this amusement park. For Mr. Sunny Lau, things have come full circle. It is quite a show. The story of Tiong Baru is a showcase of our nation's heritage. A story that is apparent in how we used to live. And the struggles that we encountered in the past. This is a story of how we grew up and the struggles we faced. Reflected in a part of Tiong Baru that is perhaps one of the smallest enclaves on the island. Close to 20,000 people live in the HDB heartland of Bukit Ho Sui. It is a modern neighborhood. But one with a dark past. Fifty years ago, the landscape was completely different. This HDB estate rose from the ashes of the biggest fire in Singapore's history. During the 1960s, the area around Bukit Ho Swee was home to one of the poorest squatter settlements in Singapore. Thousands of people lived in cramped and unsanitary conditions in the old Atap houses of the day. But things were about to change. In 1961, a huge fire engulfed 250 acres of the squatter settlements in Bukit Ho Swee. This was equivalent to 250 football fields. Four were killed, 85 injured, and 16,000 made homeless. It was the biggest fire in the nation's history and would form the seeds of early housing in the country. Mr. James Xia has been living in Bukit Ho Swee since the 1950s. He remembers what happened during the fire. This is really the first experience. I have never seen it on the movie, or at the time don't have television. And so when I saw the fire, I just do not have fear. It was in fact like very exciting. Oh, what's happening, you know, and all that. And I didn't know that this is you know, a tragedy for Bukit Ho Swee victims that in the end, they become homeless. So during the fire, see a lot of uh, this um, fear and uh, people running about, you know, and I saw my neighbor's daughter, you know, uh, squeezing down 
and are praying, you know, looking at the black smoke sky. So confusion, sound, and we, everyone was running. In 1961, construction started on one of the earliest housing projects in the nation's history. More than 8,000 flats were built. It was the early years of the modern HDB neighborhoods we're so used to seeing today. At, at its most uh, fundamental level, of course, the fire uh, basically uh, eradicated some of the slums, much of the slums, but it also presents uh, the government at that time an opportunity for them to move uh, a lot of the affected households into what was then modern social housing. Uh, for example, in Tiong Bahru and as well as a new, in the new satellite towns. So, uh, as a, in, in terms of the way of life and the lifestyle, it's a remarkable shift away from the old um, sort of squatter uh, sort of lifestyle to a so-called new modern living uh, in flats with uh, modern sanitation facilities and uh, basically a, a, a new way of life. Today, Bukit Ho Swee is a very different place. It is as if this 50-year-old neighborhood in Tiong Bahru is hiding her troubled past. But just down the road from here, she shows a completely different face. Little champagne in your coffee in the morning, hoping you can make it through the day. I'm in it is quite a different world from the heartlands of Bukit Ho Swee. Conserved as part of Singapore's heritage in 2003, these uniquely designed flats in Tiong Bahru are modern day clues to a bygone era. They provide a glimpse to the unique lives of the people in the oldest housing estate on the island. During the 1900s, the area was home to thousands of squatters built by the locals. In the 1920s, the SIT, or Singapore Improvement Trust, constructed these new flats to counter that problem. They designed the flats according to something that was pioneered by the Europeans, emulating the simple lines that emphasize linear symmetry and simple elegance. It was called Art Deco. If we look at contemporary buildings of the, of the 1930s, major buildings, uh, we can find that the Tanjung Paga Railway Station, uh, as well as the uh, old Kalang Airport, uh, also in the 1930s, was built with, uh, with a consideration of Art Deco as a kind of a, uh, aesthetics for the building. Uh, this was a tremendously uh, popular uh, style and also together with uh, the use of reinforced concrete which was tested at uh, Tanjong Paga railway station, uh, it became a very appealing kind of a uh, style. So I think the older Tiong Bahru flats uh, were also sort of uh, uh, trying to make use of that style. As the nation progressed during the 1960s, 54,000 of them were built to house the increasing population in Tiong Bahru. But the housing wasn't cheap. Each flat cost $200 to rent per month, which was a substantial amount back then. The people who eventually lived here during the 1960s were pretty well off. Mr. Go Kim Hua, describes how life was like at that time. Tiong马路这边,也算作是比较中上层阶级的一些 
。中包路还有另外一个出名的名称是二奶村嘛，这二奶村是啊，就是说，当时有一些有钱的老板包养这个二奶，在中包路这边，哦，尤其是我们现在看到的这是个好像中包路，呃，这个中包路了。呃，这个这条街这这个地带呢，这个、距离波底比较靠近嘛，所以这些老板都是在波底做生意的嘛，所以当他们午餐时间，可以来跟二奶相聚嘛，哦，所以这些二奶就很多是，就居住在这个这条街道的两这边两旁的这个站前主路里面嘛。之后呢，就是有另外一批的居民搬进来了，就是很多是在。波迪呀、啊，啊，或者是邻近的区域，或者是在这边做生意的，这，的的的居民在搬进来这些赚钱的族了，啊，都是也可能是在牛车水，呃，好像我的邻里是牛牛车水金店工作的啦，啊，有些是，呃，有教师啊，也有公务员啊，啊，呃，还有一般的这个民众啦，从一九六六年开始又。这个这个人口的结构的变化又是另外一个转变。呃、uh, ，Tiongbaru started as、uh, a test bed for social housing programs. So,、uh, in the 1920s and 30s, for example,、uh, the SIT, the Singapore Improvement Trust,、uh, used Tiongbaru as almost like a laboratory to to test out、uh, new planning principles.、Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the uh, British New Town planning principles. So,、uh, the design of、uh, Tiongbaru at that time. Uh, focus a lot on creating small, intimate neighborhoods、uh, with walkable streets,、uh, interspersed with green spaces and common facilities. So the significance is、uh, it, it, it is huge because at that time,、uh, basically, the housing stock in Singapore was,、uh, was 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 very old and it's very crowded. As the rest of Singapore was developed, most of the original residents of the area moved out. In a bid to celebrate our history and architecture, the government designated Tiong Bahru a heritage site in 2003. The area was conserved, and none of the buildings were to be torn down. Tiong Bahru would be a showcase of our heritage for future generations to come. But Tiong Bahru. Estate itself forms a very interesting contrast of、uh, housing in in one place. And if you add the Bukit Ho Swee area, which is across the road,、uh, as well as the emergency housing,、uh, they tell a kind of a very early housing history of Singapore,、uh, which is worthy of、uh, heritage conservation、uh, as a kind of a living、uh, district. I saw the question mark above your head. You But just like any other neighborhood. Tiong Bahru is changing. Her people still celebrate their past, but in pretty unique ways. It's about our heritage, a neighborhood that celebrates its food, draws inspiration from its designs, and went through a lot in her life. But her story is changing. The new people here. Are celebrating the legacy that she has left behind, and she has a pretty special place in everyone's hearts. During the recent years, more than ten establishments and businesses have opened up in Tiong Bahru. Many have come to the area for its quiet charm. And perhaps to reminisce a bygone era in the history of the neighborhood. It is a heritage that many want to preserve in different ways.
This shop called White Canvas Gallery showcases paintings and sculptures by local artists in Singapore. A significant number of works here are based on a central theme, Tiong Baru. This neighborhood has been painted, sculpted, and films have been made about her. She's pretty famous. Um, there is only one Tiong Baru really in Singapore. For all the visitors who come in, um, whether they are locals or expats, people who have heard of us, um, many of them come in because they want to be able to um, maybe you know, appreciate the artworks, I mean appreciate artworks of Tiong Baru, as well as um, for them it is I think an opportunity to bring back um, an iconic piece of Singapore as well. For most of these artists, um, the interesting thing is they can all be standing at the same building, looking at it, but every artist will come out or come away with it from a very different interpretation. For some, it could be maybe the spiral staircase, as I said. For some others, it could actually be the ledges, you know, the curve of the ledges. Um, for some, it is just um, the art deco roofs. So I, I think for most of them, they find that um, there is something that they are able to see and the sense of, um, how do I say, it, the proportion as well. I, I must say, I'm sure over the years, uh, many artists would have painted Tiong Baru, um, but probably there was no avenue for them to display it or an avenue that is physically in Tiong Baru where I guess the linkage or the relevance is a lot greater in that sense. Some are still trying out new ways to preserve this heritage. Little champagne in your coffee in the morning. Ms. Tan Sok Fong has been an artist for over 20 years. I'm inclined to a strong and unique part of her work revolves around recreating the architecture that is so iconic here. But she's not doing it with a brush. Practiced in different parts of the world since the 1960s, she's practicing a unique form of art called glass sculpting. You walk back there, you just feel that there is a very strong sense of uh, heritage. Um, you know that entire Chiang Baru area actually move or grow from a pre-war building and then in the 60s and then 70s, 80s. It gone through the whole entire uh, history, uh, growing up history in Singapore. You can actually still see, you know, some of the things that like the gates, the window grill. As an artist, all these are important because this uh, gives the, the creative uh, palette more things to, to use, more things to play, and more things to create. So as and when I can just turn around at certain area and can see that, hey, I can actually use this. Look at the window grill. Wow, the patterns of it is in the 60s. I can actually use it. And Miss Tan shapes it to look like something out of Tiong Baru. This is inspired by the Tiong Baru staircase. As you can see that this is the core, like the staircase core that you have. And then this is actually the steps that you know, you're going up and as you move up, it's just a little bit like, you know, the spiral, like an um, aeroplane wing that actually it, it, it swirl. When I was younger, uh, very, very little at that time, uh, when we actually purchase things from downstairs, sometimes we don't need to go down. We actually uh, lower the basket, you know, bring it down and then we put the money there. The people downstairs will put the food you know, be it noodles, be it sweets or biscuits or anything. This piece was actually based on that kind of feeling. So it's a mixture of memory, architecture, uh, uh, and I create this piece of work. It is perhaps a showcase of how special Chung Baru is in the hearts of her people. This old estate on the island has been celebrated time and time again yet some are still inspired by this 50-year-old neighbourhood. Just around the corner from here, 
Miss Tan Tiong Pin and her friends are organizing a food tasting session in their lifestyle shop. Opened in 2011, they are one of the new establishments that have sprung up around the area. The food here, however, is not your standard fare. It comes from the small country of Bhutan. The Singapore entrepreneur and her friends want to showcase the wonders of this little country to other people, right here in the heart of Tiong Bahru. Our passion that we love Bhutan so much that no, started this shop, and also we like to uh, we like to let uh, so called bring Bhutan near to Singapore, and also if possible, no, the best of Bhutan to Singapore. With this uh, Bhutan shop coming, most of them started to know more about Bhutan and also have a better understanding of this country, their culture. This is uh, red rice with uh, chicken. Thank you. You're welcome. You're going to Bhutan, right? Yes. Yes. Actually, it's the demography of uh, Tiong Bahru, the changing demography of Tiong Bahru that really you know, this make us decide to open a shop here. Right. As if, if you can if you notice, uh, it's more, there are more yuppies and uh, expatriates here. In a way, like a cycle. They attract, you know, they attract these uh, youngster. They attract these expatriates because of their products, their services. Just like us, you know, we have Bhutan tour. Bhutan is an exotic tour. So we also cater to this market. So somehow, rather, people from as far as uh, you know, Bukit Timah, from as far as Thompson, this, as, all these so-called our uh, the target or target customer, they just come here. It's one of the little surprises in a neighborhood with a long history. Jiang Baru is changing in many ways, but many still come here to experience an atmosphere that is quite unlike any other neighborhood. She is, after all, pretty unique. It's a story about the heritage that Tiong Baru has left behind. This mature estate on the island has given us new ways to enjoy our well-loved local fare. She has made us scream and cry. And laugh and live. She had a troubled past, but she gave her people a chance to make a name for themselves. Jung Baru has now attracted a whole new generation of people. She's truly quite inspiring. I have seen you see